two levels, two things. One of them, take the unease that is expressed everywhere in the Netherlands and elsewhere around the impact, negative consequences of globalization. We need to take it not only seriously, we need to be addressing it, that's one. Secondly, globalization will continue to take shape. A lot of countries are already negatively affected by it, but in the Netherlands, for ourselves to remain competitive, we need to look at our innovation agenda, which we are, digitalization, the nature of work, and the continuous changing nature of the type of economic activity that will be part of the future. We know many jobs are disappearing. Who goes to an Albert Heijn and is still serviced by a person behind a counter? I mean, I grew up, and of course, I'm much older than all of you are, Everybody was, there was a person. We're not uh, checking in and out. I mean, you've got the, in the States, I believe, but we have them here too, probably in New York or actually Atlanta. You can go to stores where you no longer, you don't no longer have any, uh, no money, of course, a credit card, any other card. There is not even a person in the store. You are biometrically entering. You, you're checked in and out somehow, and that's it. You, you get your goods. That's it. This is personless economic transaction. That is fundamental and it's happening under our very eyes. So if we're looking then at Eurozone's discussion, it's all extremely important, but we also need to deal with the change and find new work, new ways of being part of a fast changing society. Mm -hmm. And within that we have uh, in inequality within our society, within the European Union, and this can be a source of great tension. And of course to turn uh, a risk area into a source of opportunity. We need to make sure we look at which jobs, for whom, when, the level of training, and how you can transition continuously. Mm. So a message of fear, and you versus me, is, to my, to from my perspective, not going to help you or me. Mm -hmm. We'll both be losers. But um, I'd, I'd like to bring it back to uh, the future of trade or the, the mm -hmm. present trade situation as well. I think. Know, these problems or challenges you've mentioned in the, the economy as a whole are incredibly important, but looking closer to where we are now, and yeah. um, the Netherlands does depend on exports, and um, one potential negative impact on that is, is Brexit and the changing relationship there. So we'd like to ask you, how vulnerable would you say the Dutch economy is to Brexit at the moment? Well, we'll be the most impacted after um, the uh, island. That's a given, based on the economic nature in, and the intrinsic relationship we have with the UK. At the same time, we've prepared like no one else in the European Union. I mean, I wish, mm. frankly speaking, the UK had pr as prepared for Brexit as we have. So um, I. <laughs> uh, and so would you. Um, so mm -hmm. we are prepared in terms of contingencies, emergency laws, uh, preparing the sectors, looking at alternative markets, we have mm -hmm. done that. But it's, it, it would be naive to present this as, a, oh no, we're so ready, therefore nothing will harm or hurt us. No, there will be an economic impact. At the same time, it is a given. We have messaged at political levels uh, through economic channels, and I believe within the UK too, saying this is a no-win situation for anyone. Please rethink, rethink, mm. rethink. Um, I'm not going to speculate whether there'll be a second referendum, if there would be a new government, all that is for British Parliament and the British political process. What is uh, ex potentially insightful about all of this, of course, that we don't hear any more voices, well, a few, about Nexit. So I think the mm. Brexit experience alone, even just observing it on TV. But there's still a political party in the Netherlands that votes for Yeah, but it's not clear between the first and second House of Parliament. Yeah. So um, sure. we've, we've spent some time, uh, I think all of us, uh, trying to read up on that. Mm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But anyway, that um, what is more important, I think most people uh, have, have observed and learned that uh, the, the price of exit is higher uh, than, than the, uh, is the price is higher than any other scenario. Mm. Secondly, I think it's given a new impetus to all of us, not only to unpack and appreciate what the gains are of membership in the European Union, and you can't have it all, but also how we can help reform and when the new agenda comes. It's the European parliamentary election. Now is the time to vote for parties and people that say this is what we stand for. This is what we want to treasure. And it's not just the economic transactions I mentioned before. It is a community of value. It's human values. It's European citizenship in a world under pressure that is eroding, where the number of illiberal democracies is actually on the rise. And what do we stand for as Europe? 
I don't like to project Europe only as a political experiment or a process or only as an economic transactional mechanism. It is more than this. But don't you think that, um, uh, well, in my mind, I believe that a significant factor in why Britain voted to leave was that there isn't this strong European yeah. identity. Um, people talk of a, a European know. Union of interests and a Europe of values. And I think the interest is there economically, but compared to the United States, for example, there is, I don't think people have that intrinsic connection to Europe. I mean, 70 years ago, we were fighting each other. 80 years ago, so are you optimistic that we can attain that, that solidarity, that identity? Well, you know, um, I was a student, as you know, in the UK as well, and um, I found it remarkable uh, that I heard the same language uh, that I heard sort of like 30 years ago, 35 years ago, wait a minute, I was in the UK 85, I left 85, 88, I worked there, 90, no, I graduated 88. I did a number of degrees. <laughs> so I graduated in 88. How many years is that? Hard uh, to keep track. Yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, people then were talking about Europe as if they were not a member of the European Union. Um, yeah. I've always felt sometimes that from a UK perspective and r irrespective political party of, of political leadership in parties, the message was always fog in channel, Europe isolated, continent mm. isolated. Continent and Europe are equated to be the same, which is not the case. And secondly, the language within the uh, United Kingdom has never changed. It was always bashing Brussels. There's never been a positive sell of the gains, the benefits, except when Margaret Thatcher went to Brussels, of course, and got the famous rebate. Mm. Uh, so I would say there's been a relative uh, partial membership. And sometimes, if you look at it, it was as if we had joined the United Kingdom, and now the United Kingdom wants to get rid of us. <laughs> So you sort of have to wonder in political psychological terms what this has meant over the decades. Yeah. What I think is hopeful that a, a young generation of students, internationals, but of course it's in the urban area of the met metropolis of London, are sort of saying, hang on a minute, we see this larger scheme in terms of a global community, the economies are based on global value change, it's about services, it's about transactions of a totally different nature. It's also an aspect of populism, of course, that with very few facts, a very important referendum was established and won. And this, I think, should be uh, of concern to all of us, that with very light on facts, high on innuenda, innuenda you can actually change the course of history. But maybe this was bound to happen, what we, as the remaining members, or rather 27, and we are a founding member, need to learn is to build up on what we are, reform what needs to be reformed, and be much more uh, effective in the, in the communication around what it presents, what we deliver for citizens, and of course also listen to the voices. Mm. But this bashing of Brussels uh, uh, and, and sort of lifting sovereignty to a level that, uh, sort of that, is, uh, that brings it back to cartoon level. You don't need a parachute because you can jump out of the uh, helicopter with your flag in hand and you'll be fine. <laughs> you know, these funny cartoons, some of them, it's sort of we're fooling ourselves here. And I think the economic picture that you asked about is very clear. The intrinsic interactions, <coughs> the economic benefits, sectors, companies will be heavily impacted. Travel. Mm trade tariffs, uh, is the unpacking of the relationship is very, very difficult, and that should demonstrate to us how intertwined we've become. It's a pity, but hopefully it'll lead us on a different uh, path and a different but equally close relationship. The United Kingdom and the Netherlands share many values and certainly have a many ties, and we need to continue to build on that. I'm, I'm sure that the... But you're not, I'm not speaking to you as a British politician. <laughs> I, <try> to, <laughs> I feel I need to give you hope. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, maybe, maybe um, as you said, there would be some sort of, uh, there is an intrinsic connection there in value and in economic interest, yeah. and I'm sure both parties, despite all the, the nonsense that has happened over the past couple of years, that do actually want a, r a relationship. But um, and being British, I do like to look at the optimistic side of, mm. of Brexit, and um, one of those potential benefits is the ability to, for Britain to now go out and create new free trade arrangements, a greater freedom and control. Um, I'm not saying that it's going to be easy, but I was wondering as a minister for trade, have you found working in a customs union that that has impacted your ability to prioritize Dutch trade interests? Yeah, 
I actually think the narrative that you're, that's being sold there, I know that is sort of called, uh, you see it everywhere on airports, a free trade is great or something, and then it's a global Britain, I believe. Mm. <laughs> the UK market will shrink. Uh, there's a reason why 250 companies alone, with Brexit in mind, are yeah. relocating. There's a reason why a lot of investors are actually looking to sort of shore off their uh, financial interest elsewhere. The UK, of course, is a big market still, but its vantage point was also that it was a member of the European Union. Now, you could argue <coughs> if you're some, if you're Brexiteer, you mm. say, yeah, of course they would say so because that's all they have in their argumentation. But it's real and will be measured. We know that a number of countries that were looking to sign up or negotiate with the United Kingdom or other countries free trade agreements, they would say, no, we're not copying, copycatting now the EU agreement because that was with the EU, the largest market there is out but there. What, what's your own um, opinion on how you deal with uh, in a customs union when no, negotiating I'll come, I'll on come to that. Okay, uh, so, so the whole narrative that the UK is, uh, can, uh, can loyally negotiate wonderful agreements, uh, I, I, I hope so for the UK, but I think truth remains, that, that very mm. much remains to be seen because the market dynamics will have changed. Mm. Th that asset of being a member of the European Union within the customs union and free access, free movement of people, goods, etc. is lost. And that's a high price to pay, which I think will be measured over time. We don't feel it. It's the, uh, I mean, I joined as a minister of trade. I can't compare the days before or the days after. So I'm used to uh, working and living with the commission that negotiates on our collective behalf. Mm -hmm. It is collective bargaining power, same as you would have through a trade union. The, the scale issue and the scope issue that is offered through the union is phenomenal. And as a trading nation, we have significantly more to gain in this arrangement than we would otherwise lose. But the, the EU doesn't have trading arrangements with the US, China, Russia, some of the, the biggest markets. If, do you think that the customs union, or just the size of it and the complexity and the inability s thus far for the EU to to go out and, and certify those trade deals because it has to cope with the, the interests of 27 No, but uh, the fact that, that you don't have a, a trade agreement doesn't mean you don't have trade. Let's say the US is one of our biggest uh, 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 foreign investors and we are one of the biggest foreign investors in the US. Yeah. Uh, on certain sectors, it's phenomenal. That's why we're hosting this year the Global Entrepreneurial Summit. Trade, a trade agreement is one thing, bilateral trade and sectoral trade or companies, companies vote with their feet. Trade agreements are meant to facilitate it for them, but trade happens regardless. Mm -hmm. Trade happened long before we ever spoke of created trade agreements or customs unions, that's one. Secondly, with, uh, with the Russian Federation, the Netherlands is uh, a big investor and there are companies that are present in the Russian Federation and economic ties continue, irrespective of the political tensions that may exist or very contentious issues that we have certainly f following MH17, but also the sanctions in place. Thirdly, when you come to China, um, Prime Minister Rutte and I led the largest ever trade mission to the Chinese People's Republic last year. So trade happens. Mm. And Dutch business people are not waiting for trade agreements. Trade, trade frameworks are meant to help facilitate and lower the barriers. And uh, it, it's benefited us. We find that there is value in EU negotiated trade agreements because it helps us also in political dialogue and it raises the bar on human rights, animal welfare, mm -hmm. social standards, labor standards. And that I think is the important social dimension as much as the trade aspect. Mm -hmm. So if we, we uh, had negotiations with the US on a trade deal, the TTIP, it, it didn't uh, materialize, materialize yet, unfortunately. Um, but how do you see the future of Dutch trade then? If Do you see uh, an opportunity for strengthening U.S. ties? Do you see stronger cooperation with China, for example, through the One Belt, One Road project? Or would you see uh, more cooperation with uh, developing countries regarding trade? With which countries? Right? Developing countries. Developing countries. Well, it's not an either or, either or. We are working, uh, I, let me talk which, which of the big topics you want to take. Okay, on the U.S., we disagree on many of the issues when it comes to the WTO, the approach. It's about the process, not the form. We want a reform of the World Trade Organization as much as the US or other countries, <coughs> but we want to strengthen the multilateral system. We are very strongly supportive of the Commission, uh, Commissioner Malmstrom and also President Juncker's approach when it comes to the, the dialogue with the US on the tariffs, on steel and aluminium, yeah. and of course a limited framework to take forward the discussions we need to have. 
The US is one of our strongest allies, partners in many fields. We want to strengthen that invest, but we want the knives off the table. So it's not an either or. When it comes to China, uh, we are following, of course, with great interest, the US-China trade negotiations. Uh, we have a number of issues when it comes to intellectual property theft, technology, and, and, and. The list is quite long. But when, when you say we there, is that the Netherlands or the EU? Uh, both. But there's an EU-China framework, and as you know, the cabinet, Dutch cabinet is coming out with a China policy mm -hmm. in which also aspects of trade will be discussed. Mm -hmm. uh, now, when it comes to trade or trade negotiations, these are the issues we raise in all bilateral fora. We, in this case, now as the cabinet. Mm -hmm. But it's very similar to what we have as a policy position as the EU, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. unlike the UK, where we can be quite, can mer be merged <laughs> into the <laughs> EU. Um, but um, so uh, when it comes to China, we, the issues of technology, Belt and Road Initiative, we, uh, we now, the Netherlands, are not because a number of EU member states have signed already mm. the Belt and Road Initiative. W I'm, I wouldn't be a proponent uh, to rush towards si uh, signing this framework because we have doubts mm -hmm. about uh, some of the tenants, uh, the scope, uh, quality, and what it would really bring. The first point of departure now is the Dutch-China uh, strategic framework that is going to be submitted to Parliament and discussed yeah. by Parliament, submitted by my colleague, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, on behalf of the whole Cabinet. That would be that starting point. Yeah. Trade with developing countries, extremely important. Um, um, sus sustainable trade, creation of jobs. At the moment, sadly, uh, what happens, of course, it's a very one-way street. Uh, most developing countries find it very hard to access uh, the European Union, uh, mm -hmm. despite uh, partnership agreements or association agreements or other forms. Issues of quality are important, the tariff barriers, and we need to invest much more and help them overcome those hurdles because we need to help create jobs there and we need to help these countries boost the quality so they can compete in an effective and inclusive manner. I believe yeah. this is the big game changer for most of these countries. Okay, let's just see uh, in the audience to see if there are any questions. Here in the front. Hi. Um, I would like to ask you a question regarding um, your career in the UN. Mm -hmm. I, th I understand you were a UN Special Coordinator for Lebanon yeah. a few years back. Yeah, and um, I had a question about the statelessness of children there. So in the last eight years, there's been about two million Syrian refugees pouring into Lebanon, who of course have, you know, got children, yeah. made children. Um, and h hundreds of thousands of these chil children are now uh, stateless. How do you think this situation would pan out? Like, um, the statelessness of these children, of course, means that they don't have a state responsible for enacting their rights. Um, how do you think this will pay, uh, pan out? And h also, how should it play out from your perspective as yeah. UN and Dutch ministry? Well, I'll speak first uh, to old knowledge. Uh, first of all, the official uh, number of registered Syrian refugees were about 1.1, 1.2 million. In the Lebanese media, there's often talk of that they be around 2 million. That wasn't confirmed. The UN, we registered up to 1.1, 1.2 per year. Around 90,000 children were, I believe, born. They are not stateless, but they are without documentation. That's a big difference. Their state exists. Um, but in the system between the Lebanese and the Syrians, it was made very hard for the parents due to cost, obstacles, official obstacles, and less, less, le, you know, less visible obstacles. It was very hard for parents to register their children. We have pushed consistently, with the help of donor countries also, to make sure that the Lebanese authorities take away a number of these hurdles and that all children are registered, because without birth registration, you indeed de facto cease to exist, and you can reach a state of statelessness in future. That's a big fundamental difference, but they have a state. The second level is that the state, as we see in the return opportunities for refugees who want to go back voluntarily from Lebanon or elsewhere, the Syrian refugee uh, regime is not making it easy, to say the least, to allow these people to come back. They've put new obstacles in their way. So all this is, I think, increasing the risks, particularly for hosting countries, Lebanon and Jordan, that they, over a very long period of time, they feel they're getting stuck with people who are in a gray zone, in a twilight zone. And we do not provide collectively enough funding for these countries to host them. There's tremendous uh, impact and damage to the infrastructure 
and there is a risk to their social cohesion. A country such as Lebanon, one in three is a refugee. I used to say that, imagine that one day, from one day to the next, six million Belgians, uh, whom we love dearly, but come across the border, speak the same language, similar history, and, and, and. You go and figure it out and see if everyone is so willing to keep on hosting over a 10, 15 year period. This is very hard for any given country because of the nature and the scale and the scope. Uh, so it's tough. What we continue to do is provide humanitarian and development assistance and investment assistance to countries such as Lebanon and Jordan. They are focused countries. Is it enough to deal with all the problems that they have? No, but within the European Union, together, we're doing a lot. It's also up to these governments, particularly Lebanon, I've just come back from Lebanon, but in a private capacity, to deal with issues of corruption, governance, to provide the investment uh, climate where more could be done. But the protracted presence of refugees in a very turbulent region um, is a big challenge and a source of concern for all. The international community invests in these countries to help stabilize and build stability. But ultimately, for refugees, most of them, majority will always tell you they want to go home but it has to be safe, dignified, and voluntary. Those are the main elements of the convention, and it's always the task and the ask of UNHCR to confirm that. Thank you for your question. Um, unfortunately, we only have time for one now. Um, we have to push on, and that's a nice bridge to our next section about development cooperation, mm -hmm. the other, other half of your job. Um, to start off very generally, why do we provide aid to developing countries? Okay, yeah, this is part of the 21st century debate. It's true. Uh, a few decades ago, we were, of course, this was, a, this was a question, of course, we should. Mm. And then there's been ups and downs in the whole spectrum. I think there is an overestimation of the volume of aid. Um, it's usually only catalytic. Mm. And Netherlands is still amongst the more generous countries. Fortunately, there is an international commitment that we strive towards 0.7% of our gross national product. We give it because on the one hand, if you look at it from an aspirational perspective, it's the right thing to do, to provide some assistance to people most in need, affected by conflict, crisis, girls out of school, um, women that are raped uh, in, in times of conflict, and there are 50,000 reasons you can mention. Secondly, from a very rational perspective, international assistance is a way to work, to build ties, and to do your small part to build international stability and therefore also contribute towards security. The third part is really that aid is only the small bit, so it's catalytic. You help invest in programs that maybe nobody else will. You support human rights defenders because certainly their own government, uh, own governments or regimes may be the most oppressive. So if you care about human rights as being a global universal value, you help contribute to that. You give it meaning and you, in a way you give it wings. Last but not least, you help build an environment where investments, trade, education, reforms can flourish. So there's a very rational case. Nowadays, we give international assistance or aid to help build progress towards the Agenda 2030, which is a global one, a universal one, and it is a shared one, so it affects all of us. I know there are still people, and growingly, that are very cynical around the value of aid, or lots of books are written that it's all a waste of time, waste of money, waste of effort. I haven't yet heard of a substitute, substitute for aid, because aid, as I said, is only the small part of the puzzle of international yeah. cooperation, that is equally compelling. It needs to be well allocated, well spent, well accounted for, but it can be life-changing for many communities, and for many individuals. And we provide for focus nationally. We work on education, <coughs> agriculture, land, humanitarian assistance, and across the board, we look at issues of gender and gender equality mm. and mm -hmm. human rights. Yeah, so when talking about the 21st debate, because unfortunately, there's still an ongoing debate on the use of aid. On the one hand, there's the argument that it fosters economic growth, that it reduces poverty, but that there's also the skepticist side that say that it eventually, development aid doesn't reach those who need it most. Mm -hmm. So what's your stance in, stance in this debate? Well, you know, I find the debate is a bit artificial um, because reality is often very different. 
you need to provide international assistance, and it's also a tool for countries such as the Netherlands, because to be very honest, we've got aid and trade. That's when our voice is really heard. Uh, it's not by just giving speeches or issuing statements on a particular country situation. So it's also a tool in your diplomatic international toolkit. Um, you need to provide assistance, you need to be selective, you need to be clear on your partnerships and your focus areas, and mm. I think our international trade and aid policy does that. The trade part, the investing, the fostering an inclusive economic climate is to build chances and allow to allow a local economy to take off, to create jobs, to build prospects, to invest in prospects for the young population, mm -hmm. men and women alike, and build from the economic situation of that country. So not from our perspective, our needs, it is bottom up from their perspective. Yeah. And this is how you can build the change. But if you look at the additional budget that you received uh, in the current government, then we see that a lot of that budget is uh, spent on humanitarian aid, which is arguably more uh, a prevention and, and rebuilding after crisis and not really aimed at fostering growth in that sense. So do we see a shift then from the, the original idea of development aid of making sure that developing countries don't need it anymore to more prevention and, and rebuilding in crisis situations? No, you know, there's been really, I think, uh, a wrong, uh, there's the wrong casting of aid in the past and this frame persists. Aid has never been intended because the volume was always way too small. Aid has never been intended to help countries finish with their poverty forever. It can never do that. Mm. Then you need a Marshall Plan for almost every country. Aid was always meant to be one input as part of a longer path of change. You need legislation, you need the IMF, you need serious loans, you need the World Bank, you need that whole package. So our modest and any other country bilateral aid contribution was always finite and very specific. That's mm. one. So that's just a myth that refuses to die. The second part that's important, we don't spend more or we haven't made a shift on humanitarian assistance. There have been some additional money that's come in for uh, hosting in the region because of the unique nature of the refugee crisis. Mm -hmm. But the bulk of our development aid has gone on education, sexual reproductive rights and health, investing in land uh, reclamation, agriculture, agriculture management to create jobs, to build food security, to look at all these issues. But aren't you afraid that local governments in developing countries become aid dependent in that sense? No, because the money is just too, 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 too finite, it's too small. Too small. It's just nothing almost. The, the, the IMF have uh, warned about increased dependency in, in certain regions, and not only the dependency, but also the nature of investments. I'm talking specifically about the transparency of certain investments in, into Africa from countries like China or Russia. And do you, if the IMF is saying this, do you, do you not think that there is a problem there, both on the dependency side and the nature of investments, the nature of this coming into the country? We have to be very careful to make a distinction between aid as grants and investments. And uh, the, bi the chunk of the concessional uh, loans come via the World Bank, but those are loans and they're to be repaid. Um, the Chinese angle, of course, is the more interesting one because the Chinese come with serious amounts of money, $60 billion for Africa, where we are still nickel and diming, let's say, in comparison to the Chinese. Mm. They've come, questions asked later, conditionality will turn out later, and that is the big risk factor now for many countries, that they have accrued a debt burden for the future and their economic investments are not such that they can actually be in a position to pay off. Mm -hmm. And that means that you pay off with minerals, with oils, you sort of, you forfeit your, your land. Uh, and I think that's a big geopolitical risk as much as an economic risk. But aid in the purest form is too small. It's the European Union that is a very generous donor. So within that, of course, we make our contribution. But even so, it is the larger package, investment, access to markets, training, uh, labor schemes, uh, remittance management, the battle against corruption, mm -hmm. and ultimately, if you look at the Addis, Adeb uh, Addis Abeba uh, agenda for financing, which accompanied the 2030 agenda, it's about domestic resource mobilization, which is taxes. Taxes, 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 and taxation, and the spending of taxation. That is the biggest investment these countries need to make <coughs> themselves. So the very artificial 
dialogue aid versus trade, mm -hmm. I think is not part of this era. It's actually a very smart mix mm -hmm. of instruments. And then secondly, it's volume. But I know in any country when uh, people are concerned about their domestic budget, if they feel that a hospital is closing down and there is an image portrayed that we're closing this hospital in this corner, in this country, in our own country, yeah. but yet we're spending money on education in Niger. People think Isn't that a shame? Lately, so. But it's uh, a very, um, let's say, politely put, misleading representation uh, of mixed okay. facts. Mm -hmm. So when talking about that interaction between trade and aid, you have been criticized of having a skewed focus more on development cooperation instead of trade. So how do you see yourself <laughs> this interaction be tra between trade and development aid? You know, it depends on who you read, because by the NGO community, I'm criticized all the time of having yeah, too much to focus on trade. Course. So yeah. I think <laughs> if both criticize you, either you do it well or you're a total loser. I like to think that we get the aid and trade dimension fairly balanced, mm -hmm. because the two uh, universes ought to meet. And most of the companies we work with, they espouse an SDG agenda. Mm. Our, our, our whole policy, uh, sector by sector, uh, with NGOs, with businesses, with developing countries around responsible business conduct is precisely a to achieve very distinct inclusive development goals. And uh, Inclusive economic growth is a development goal. It is part of the 2030 agenda. The third part is, we know we have constituencies. Uh, in the Netherlands, we have organizations dedicated to one theme, can mm -hmm. be sexual rights, reproductive health, extremely important. We haven't stopped our financing for that. At the same time, I also have a responsibility to promote Dutch export, and we do that. But it's not either or. It mm -hmm. is a very, I think, a very smart mix of instruments and objectives and it shows that they can very well go together. So you, but I don't so blame you see people. them as complements in that sense, instead of trade-offs? They have separate tracks and they have a uh, mm. uh, convergence, a strong mm -hmm. convergence, and ultimately it's the ask of the countries we work with and for, what their ask is not more aid. Mm -hmm. Their ask time and time again is access to markets, jobs, invest yes. in our young people, mm. give them training, help them be educated, and make sure they have a job for the future, so they do not have, for un amongst others, have yeah. to migrate irregularly. Uh, and that's important. Yeah, I think a good example of that uh, co convergence between trade and aid is in your current policy agenda, you really focus on the interaction between the private and the public sector, but aren't you afraid that, I mean, the private sector, of course, wants to make a profit eventually. Aren't you afraid that making profit in developing countries is only eventually benefiting the industrial elite in those developing countries? Of course, um, but with all our companies, we expect, uh, and we, we, we are quite careful with that, we expect that they sign up to the OECD guidelines on responsible business conduct, that they comply with the UN guidelines on responsible business conduct. That's why our sectoral approach is extremely important, where we build the issues of rights and behavior and compliance into the value chains. Later on, we'll be assessing and evaluating if this approach works and if it failed to achieve the objectives, if legislation to ensure compliance will be necessary, that's the big next step. Equally so, I'm not under any illusion that our agenda is going to solve all evils in the world. It depends on how realistic you want to be. I, th I believe we can make a strong contribution, we can be agenda setting, we are aiming for transformative results, but it's not the Netherlands and the world. This is the Netherlands in the European Union, this is the Netherlands in the EU, this is the Netherlands in bilateral partnerships. We need to be consistent and coherent with ourselves. But our development aid is focusing on the most vulnerable and the poorest of the poor, always. So we don't invest in governments there. We invest in people and we try to work mm -hmm. through systems where we can. With trade and companies, we don't second guess companies. Same as in the Netherlands, I don't think any Dutch investor or MKB'er, small to medium entrepreneur, would like to be second guessed by the government saying, you must invest here and there mm -hmm. and there, and this is how you'll make your profit. That's not how it works. Um, but a lot of our entrepreneurs, also on the trade missions that I see, are very mindful, and frankly speaking, they're more progressive than some of the other counterparts I sometimes meet and speak with. They all talk and breathe SDGs, they're wanting to make a difference, goals sustainable development goals. They want to contribute for good, 
they want to pay a fair wage, and this is where the value chain approach is so, ex is so important. Our next focus will be on a fair and living wage, where we've signed a partnership with the ILO to push that agenda everywhere. When labor conditions are unsafe in Bangladesh, I speak to the Prime Minister, we speak to the ministers, we ensure that the office, uh, the NGO community that is following through on the Amsterdam Accord uh, in Bangladesh will not be shut down. So we do everything from here to there. Mm. There's a huge space and role a minister can play dependent on conditions, but you should never oversell your own importance. I think over prom uh, under promise, over deliver rather than over promising. That's why I said at the beginning, I don't like many statements to say we must, we must, we must, we must. I think it's our duty to do our best, have a clear policy, mm -hmm. deliver, leverage, build partnerships, but also with a bit of humility. <laughs> okay. And um, I mean, if, as we've discussed, you say they are they are complementary or they have different tracks, but there is a point where they where they meet. Yeah. Um, on a more you know day to day basis, have you had an example, um, a time? Or could you give an example when you had to make a decision where the the trade side of it and the aid side of it really were at odds with each other? No, I would say the trade and the rights side of issues come together in arms export. Um, and ultimately then um, the balance is made. I'll give you a very practical example. Uh, Parliament uh, encouraged the government and asked the government to have a very restrictive arms export policy in regard to the Yemen conflict. Uh, that means that we do not uh, export and we are the most strict in the most strictest terms to those uh, partners in the coalition mm. uh, that are of course uh, active in and around Yemen. And that has meant that we need to look in, a more in an even stricter manner at our arms export policy. There will be a lot of ask and questions and suggestions from those <coughs> who say, but this is, this is trade, it's important, jobs are attached, it's technology, Dutch companies. Uh, I would say aided and abetted by the strong call from Parliament, uh, we've looked at the rights, the normative side, and that then takes over. Mm. Um, in doing our, our research for this interview, we came across the example of when President Trump announced he would cut his financial assistance to the UN Palestinian Refugees Program in half, and you immediately transferred 13 million to this organization in response. For us, we thought this could have been a, a time where you know, your interests uh, or your relationship with the, um, the US was coming into conflict. Uh, well, it seemed to us. Uh, something you really wanted to ensure was uh, there was sufficient funding for in, in that development area. Did you not think this was a time this could hurt trade relations with the US? No, there are two things. Uh, often forgotten in the whole media hula baloo that happened around that. A, it was already discussed in Parliament in November the year before. It's part of a regular budget allocation. All we did was is to make the payment <coughs> So like, I'm your bookkeeper, I decide to pay you two weeks sooner. Mm. We ma so th it was all discussed, debated, approved in November in our budget, because it's a yearly contribution that is standalone. 2010, 2012, other government, I'll leave it up to you which parties were part and parcel of that, PVV condoned, they paid 19, 20 million in those days to UNRWA. The Netherlands has been always been paying the United Nations Relief and Works Agency as part of support for a broader Middle East process. Mm -hmm since the end of 1950s or early 60s, maybe before. So sadly, there was nothing noble uh, in my action there. Mm. <laughs> uh, approved, debated, uh, planned. We paid two weeks sooner because it was an acute payment crisis that would have harmed 500,000 Palestine refugee children. Um, six, seven other EU countries were paying at the same time. The ask by the Secretary General was Anybody that has decided to pay, please pay sooner to avoid the total collapse of the agency. So then you d really don't think, if you think of everything trade versus, you will never do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I believe the right thing can come from a sound policy which you've debated, you've reflected on, and we were now in a moment of continuous implementation. So one of your policies, and you've already previously mentioned the use of bringing Dutch exporters to developing countries and look at the markets which they could explore in developing countries, which could also foster their growth. But don't you think it's more uh, also interesting to bring uh, Dutch importers, which will actually 
uh, in developing countries then promote local production and foster economic growth instead of bringing Dutch exporters of having we a bigger that. focus we do on that. We do that. We're, well that's how we mention it as investors. We bring companies, we bring a lot of startups as well, people with mm. an idea or have, having access to technology that wants to actually start in a developing country or a middle income country. Uh, you have to move away from the thinking of export is all of us are going with our national flag and sort of <laughs> cheese wooden shoes and we're there <laughs> and we're sort of dumping. Yeah. That's not how it works. We are coming on the demand of countries, there's an opportunity, sometimes there's scope in the market, there's mm -hmm. a consolidation potentially of market interest, <coughs> but it's very much also in a fast growing and changing economy globally that there is an ask from these countries to be connected to Dutch investors mm -hmm. or startups or people with just knowledge and knowledge centers or universities to connect and together they will figure out how they want to pursue this. Mm -hmm and how the investments will happen, where the loans will happen, how the jobs will be created. It's much more dynamic and much more exciting. But does, does the, the, the government in your ministry have a, an overarching role to ensure that the development of, uh, of private businesses in these de um, developing countries and uh, these exporters is done in a way that is sustainable in accordance with the SDGs? How much scope for intervention do you have in these relationships? That's a good one. We are not a state-led economy, of course, so in that sense uh, we're not controlling, but our instruments, our export financing instruments, access to loans, grants, is guided by the SDGs, mm -hmm. by the Human Rights Charter, and our sustainability criteria that we have. So I think this is where our influence comes together. Um, the good thing is, and something I'm very proud of, that not only, of course, our Dutch, uh, the Dutch NGOs, but also uh, a growing number of Dutch enterprises, uh, the startups and sort of the younger generation, but also existing, long existing companies are very focused on doing what is right and doing it in a sustainable manner. Because uh, as you know, uh, whether you work in not-for-profit or for profit, to consider your business through the sustainability lens is ultimately what helps you get to the next generation. And if you look at the uh, Paris Accord and the importance of dealing with climate change, the risk factors are there, but the opportunity for organizations and companies is even bigger, but it's now or never. So many, many more people are seized with the urgency mm. and the importance of doing the right thing in the right manner, much more than before. J so you look at the opportunities that Dutch businesses could bring to developing countries. Within a compliance framework yeah. and with a, uh, within the guidelines that we clearly have set for themselves. Yeah. But visit a few countries and you'll see the phenomenal change that companies you've never heard of uh, are working towards and are bringing. Of course, we have also have uh, particular uh, growth promotion instruments called Orange Corners where we sponsor local entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs from any developing country. They mm -hmm. pitch ideas and they'll be connected to an investor. But it's their company, it's yeah. their idea, particularly for young people. I mean, I'm forgetting now the different instruments that we have, but really uh, it's something you can be quite proud of and yeah. we're quite uh, uh, agenda setting and scene setting for other European Very countries. Strategic. I would like to think so, yeah. yes. Okay, yeah. let's see in the, in the audience if there are any more questions. No questions at all? Oh, there's one over here. <laughs> Such a diligent the audience. <laughs> in the former round, am I hearable? Uh, in the former round, I uh, just heard you say about overcoming hurdles. So I wanted to ask, um, let's be practical. Um, Amsterdam is the largest uh, harbor on cacao. Uh, if Ghana wants to export their cacao, uh, they're free. But if they want to export uh, chocolate, and earn money with producing the chocolate, then it's a whole different ball game. Mm. So wouldn't it be more honest to give the people in Zandam a, a different job and the po possibility for the people in Ghana to earn their own wage? Okay. Quite a specific question. Yeah, well, I don't know about the people in Zandam, <laughs> um, whether they would like to have a different job, but I think what I can tell you we're working on with IDH and other organizations precisely is to help the local cacao producers add quality to their product, have uh, predictability of their product and market, and increase their salaries, and they can organize themselves in consortia, so they actually have leveraging power, negotiating power, 
in order for them to grow. I'm not sure if we can go immediately from the export the raw product f to the having total control and ask the people of Zandam to change jobs. But I hear what you're saying in terms of local ownership, having independent status and becoming full, uh, really full-fledged competitive producers of a product that they leverage price and are no longer depend on fluctuations in the market for a raw material. They leverage price and therefore can organize themselves. It's not for me to, uh, to help brands, but I know IDH, Tony Chocoloni, others work in this fashion precisely to lift the local cacao producers and their families out of poverty and, amongst others, also deal with child labor and, and, and. Are these ch companies that are also But I'm not supporting? dealing immediately with the issue of Zandam employment. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's part of the whole chain of the negotiations. I agree, but then it's about Ghana and the Netherlands, not just one sector. Then, of course, it's about access to the market. It can be about a trade agreement, about a partnership agreement, and indeed, the impediment that uh, import barriers are significant and uh, they take away the profit margin for the exporter. We've, uh, we've spoken a lot today on, uh, on trade and aid, and I mean, probably get quite bored <laughs> in your position having to, to do it every day. So we'd like to finish on a more personal note. And it's clear that you're a, a very popular politician. You've got a, a great record. You've done many amazing, interesting things in your career and is seen by many as really a role model. Um, so to that end, would you consider becoming a party leader in the near future? <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to be asked by a British student in Amsterdam. I think that <laughs> says something for D66 <laughs> and Europe. Um, I, only, I don't live, I, my answer is always the same, and it's not the same because I practiced it, it's just the only answer I have at the moment. It's, uh, it's not something I think of, um, it's not a living question for me. I want to be part, I want to support the party in the most effective manner uh, and I, I like to see the best party leadership team move forward for the next elections so D66 can grow, our voice will be heard and mm -hmm. will have the weight that I think our, poor, our party needs. Do you uh, see yourself and hopefully in, that, is in that moving future? Uh, I've taken on many leadership roles that I never thought myself uh, undertaking, it just never entered my mind. I've also not done jobs uh, that I had aspired because it didn't happen, someone else was the right one. I'm not thinking of it in this way. My contribution to the party, I think, will be organic and, mm -hmm. and time will tell. A I don't rule anything out, but it's not something that's been on my mind when I came to the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And more general, do you have ambition to continue into Dutch politics or would you uh, rather ha see yourself in an international environment again <laughs> in the future? Um, I think my answer will be the same. You know, I left the Netherlands. Whatever comes. I, I was away 25 years. I never thought I'd be the leader on the Syria chemical weapons elimination mm. program. I mean, I failed chemistry. I never thought <laughs> did anything scientific. Um, I did many jobs, as I said, I never thought of. I didn't know they existed, some of them, or they were created. I've been in countries I never thought I'd be. Um, I'm glad to be back in the Netherlands. I came for a reason. I entered politics for a reason, because I believe now is the time. Um, but ultimately, politics is meant to be engaged by a team. I think the party has to be effective, and the leadership team is what matters. Uh, it's not a, s a, po a, s a person sailing solo that will make the change. Yeah. It is the team and the ability to weather, weather and withstand pressures. I never rule anything out because uh, so far I've it's proven that life laughs at me in the face. That's good. One way or another. <laughs> yeah. So watch, watch this space in other words. <laughs> <laughs> um, unfortunately we have to come to a close now but thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Um, it's been a, a great interview. Thank you everyone in the audience as well. Thank you.